Kelsey Lidge, thanks for taking some time to join me on the pod today. How are you? How are things going for you on campus this year with the women's basketball team? Hey, Chris, it's going pretty well. Um, I'm excited to be here and get to see you virtually. So um, I'm excited to have this uh, little chat with you. Uh, appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Uh, you had a great career, Drexel, now working there as a graduate assistant for the coaching staff. Uh, so I want to dive into your background. Let's go all the way back to where things started for you. Two sport athlete growing up playing soccer and basketball. So when do athletics enter the picture for you way back in your childhood before you even set foot in Philadelphia? Oh, yeah, I started playing sports when I was maybe seven or eight years old. It definitely ran in the family. My mom loved playing sports all the time. So it was me and my sister for everything. And our mom was our coach. So it was me and my sister for basketball, for soccer, for softball. And having my mom as the coach, it was a little difficult sometimes here and there because we have us, her screaming at us on the court or on the field. And then we have to go home and, you know, do the dishes. We get to have that too. But yeah, I started playing when I was really young and I just loved the, physicality of it. I love being on a team and being a part of something bigger than myself. And it just kept going all the way until college. And so you mentioned college. At what point did you start to realize that it was a possibility to play at a higher level, to play the game of basketball at the coll collegiate level? Um, I think it was probably started um, during the recruiting process when I started to get letters in the mail. Um, so unlike other um, people who go to college to play like I never was like a middle schooler like college basketball is my dream it was just playing basketball something I just always loved to do um, and just to realize that I had an opportunity to continue that at the college level was something that really stuck with me after I got my first letter and I was like okay like this is something real this is something that can happen and from there I just kind of buckled down even more than I already did and um, try to make it come true and what was it about Drexel that stood out to you in the recruitment process? What did you like specifically about Drexel Athletics looking back and why was it that you chose to become a Dragon? Um, so it's funny when I, uh, Drexel was the only official visit that I ever went on and it was my first official visit. Um, I had a couple plans for after that, but once I got here and met the coaching staff and I was able to hang out with the team and really felt that family atmosphere because family is very important to me. I was like, this is, this is already my home. And after I left the visit, I told the coaches I'd think about it, got on the flight home with my mom. And as soon as I landed, I called and said, I want to be, a, I want to be a dragon. Wow. wow. That's awesome. Well, it's a, it's a big geographical change for you though, coming to Drexel from Aurora, Colorado. Most, most players who come to Drexel, obviously some people come from overseas from far away, but you know, the majority of dragons come from the Philadelphia area, New Jersey, Virginia. So having to make that jump from living in Colorado to Philadelphia, what were some of those early changes that you had to adjust to living in a completely different part of the world now? Yeah, it was, it's definitely a lot different going from Colorado to Philadelphia. Um, it was something I, my mom always taught me to be independent and experience things. So going on the opposite side of the country was something that I wanted to do for myself and to learn um, it's definitely different being in the city and really learning that I don't need a car to get anywhere in Philadelphia. There's so many different options to um, the trolley or the subway or um, just walking. Um, the weather was surprisingly similar. <laughs> so that kind of gave me that feeling of like, okay, maybe I still am home. Um, but just being around Drexel, it, it didn't feel so different because I was with people who supported me, cared for me, and they took me out places and I felt safe wherever I was. So that definitely was um, very simil similar in that aspect, but I just loved kind of learning a little bit more about the history of Philadelphia since there's so much history there. Um, even taking one of the uh, history of Philadelphia class um, my freshman year. Um, so I, I just loved learning the, the different things, the new culture and the food. My goodness, the food. I love the food. <laughs> that yeah. was definitely a step up coming from Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I haven't been, so I, I can't, I can't uh, make that judgment yet. But, yeah, Philly's got some good spots, I will say. I'm a big fan. Um, <laughs> working it back to your, your early experiences, now, obviously, you got that feel that it was going to be a family atmosphere on your visit. It's one thing to feel that 
uh, for a couple of hours or for, for a day or two. It's an entirely different thing for that to manifest itself throughout a four year college experience. So for you, uh, as you look back those early days as a freshman, when did, what was it for you that established like, okay, this was the right decision. When did you start to feel uh, that you had made the right choice and Drexel was the place for you? Um, I think it has to go to two different things. Um, the on-court atmosphere versus the off-court. Um, on the court, obviously you're a freshman, you're scared, like you don't want to make a mistake. You, you want to make your upperclassmen proud and your coaches realize like, yeah, this was the right decision to bring her here. Um, but I think after I made my first mistake in having my, my older teammates pull me aside and just be like, hey, like, it's okay take a breath. You're a freshman. It's going to take time. You're going to learn this. And I was like, okay, I don't have to worry so much and I'm not going to disappoint them. If I do mess up, it's going to be a, it's going to be a process. So um, that as well as the coaching staff having an open door policy. So if we ever have a problem or have any issues, we can just go into their offices, sit down and have a conversation and talking with some of my other friends who also um, went to the collegiate level, they don't, they didn't have that same experience with their coaches and with their teammates. So um, with those conversations, I knew that this was the right decision. And then off the court, like, I just felt like they were almost like me and my family. We're just goofy, having fun, relaxing, watching movies and drinking hot chocolate. Like it was just a great um, separation of basketball and just friendships that I know I'm going to have for life. Well, and you mentioned the on-court aspect of it, and I want to get a little bit into that because it's funny, the things I remember, we both came in the same year. I was a manager mm -hmm. at the time, and I remember those early practices, your first couple of weeks, and you would have to do, you'd have to run. I think it was a, a suicide, and you had to do it in, I believe, 33 seconds, and you fell mm -hmm. short a couple times. You were, you know, I remember the look yes. on your face, how discouraged you were, but a month later, Kelsey, not only did you, were you finishing in under 33, you were blowing the competition out of the water. You were the <laughs> fastest girl on the line by far. So take me through that process because that really stood out to me. I'm sure it impressed the coaching staff. By the end of your freshman year, you ended up getting some decent playing time as well. But take me through the process of growth that you had to experience uh, as a player in that first year. Yeah, so coming in my freshman year, I was I was not the most in shape. I didn't make a lot of run tests. I think I made one out of all of them that we did. Um, the suicide ones, I remember I made one of them and then did not make anything else after that. So that was really discouraging. But um, I did have, we had conversations as a team, as a whole team with our staff, where we talked about where we were in terms of being in shape and where we need to get to if we want to help this team. So at that point, it just took a lot of personal willingness to buckle down and, and be like, if you want to make a difference in this program, and if you want to see the court, and if you want to help your teammates, you have to be better than you are right now. So with that, um, I when I did my extra shooting, I would ask for them to do more conditioning in it. I would regret it instantly when I was on the court. I, I regretted it instantly, but I knew it was going to help me in the long run. So, and I also knew it wasn't going to happen in a day. And that's something I had always talked to with um, Denise. She always told me, it, nothing ever is going to happen in one day. It's going to take time. So I had to keep reminding myself that, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be the fastest girl the next day at practice. It just doesn't work like that. But if I continue to buckle down on what I want to accomplish and how it's going to help my teammates, then as time goes on, I'm going to show those improvements. And that's exactly what I tried to do. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I look back and I, I, I like to bring that story up because for me, you know, you don't realize it, but that inspired me as, as, a, as a bystander just watching like, oh, wow, someone actually puts in the time to, to, to be, become better at that. And that was your whole career. I mean, we'll jump ahead to your senior year. You know, you guys lose Sarah Curran, Meg Creighton, Jessica Pilecchio, all the graduation coming off of a year where you had, you know, had a good record, but you get picked to finish fourth in the CAA. You know, most mm -hmm. of your seniors that year, you, Megan Marisic, Sarah Woods, 
had some experience, but not, not the, the scorers that you lost from the previous year. And then it was a young squad. But you guys set a program record for regular season wins and came a game away from making the, the NCAA tournament. And to me, that set the precedent for the success the team has had the last couple of years. So as you look back on that senior year, right, being picked to finish mm-hmm. fourth, being overlooked, what was it that you guys as a senior unit preached to the team in general? And how did you create that winning culture going into a year where – you were missing a lot of pieces, but you somehow figured a way to be even more productive than any team in program history. Yeah. So personally for me, um, after losing Jessica and Megan and Sarah, um, it made me flash back to my um, junior year in high school where we lost all of our leading scorers and everyone kept saying, okay, um, Regis, my high school, it's going to be a rebuilding year for them. It's going to be a rebuilding year. They're going to have to take some time. They're going to lose a lot of games. And in my head, I'm just like, no. So that made me flash back to that. And coming into my senior year, um, Megan, Marie, Six, Sarah Woods, and I, we sat down with each other and had a conversation of what we wanted our senior year to look like. And we said, screw all this rebuilding year stuff. Like, I don't, these people don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Like this is not us and this is not what we want. So once we sat down and made that agreement, that is what we started to preach to the rest of our team. And we also had to take a, make a commitment within ourselves um, for each of us that we have to step up to another level if we want to succeed and if we want to have our teammates follow suit. So once we made that decision, we sat the team down and we said, ignore what everyone else on the outside is saying. It's about this team right here. It's about these girls that we see in our room and then the coaching staff as well as a part of that. But as long as we all commit to this, we're going to have bad days. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be rough. But if we commit to this and we push through, we're going to have a fine season. And we're going to show everyone who said we were going to have a rebuilding year exactly what a rebuilding year is. <laughs> Well, it was, it was an impressive year for you guys. And again, it set the precedent for where the program is to, uh, at, the, at its current moment. And uh, I got, want to go back to that year of individually for you, big year for you. I mean, you get the Dean Ellers Award, you get the Mary Semenek Award. So we'll go with each of those Dean Ellers Award first. What did it mean to you to get that honor? It's an award that multiple players in your program's history have gotten it. Meg Creighton got it the year uh, before you, I believe, for her assisting others challenge. And that's what you kept going and probably the, re- the reason you got it. But what did it mean to you to get that award, that honor, that recognition from the CAA? I mean, it, it's a huge honor. Um, it shows, too, that, yes, basketball is very important to me, um, but it's not the only thing. Um, ra- being raised with uh, my mother, she taught me a lot about helping others who are more in need of you. And I would have never got to where I am currently if it wasn't the help for others that supported me and got me to where I am. So um, taking that time to, even if it's just like an extra hour here or an extra hour there to find a way to volunteer or to help others was um, very important to me and still is very important to me. And to get it after um, Megan Creighton, who had just recently got it, um, was an even more of an honor because she was one of my inspirations um, and one of the people that I followed suit and and types of leadership and being there on the court and off the court for my teammates. So she was a big inspiration for me. So to be named that with the Dean Ellers with her as well as um, other Drexel Dragons in the past was a great honor. And um, I was very happy (laughs) to receive that. Oh, and kind of a follow-up before I ask you about the Seminac award, you know, with such a rich history at Drexel with the Dean Ellers award, what is it about the culture that has been created there specifically that allows for so many people to have such a positive impact on their community? Yeah, I mean, it's when you first get there and when you're in your preseason, yes, we talk about basketball, what we're going to do this year, but we also sit down as um, a whole entire staff and team and talk about what community service that we're going to do to help others. And that is put in just like it is with practice because we understand that, we are at like a higher level and have more of a voice than some others do. So with that, we have to use that. We have to be a part of making a difference and helping others just as important. So that was preached from head coach to assistant coach to Dobo to GA. Everyone was on that path and creating that 
environment um, just set the tone for when you got there, as soon as you got there? Well, I think it creates an environment for people to thrive, you know, and you've said it both on and off the floor, but it feeds into the game and, and you took your game to such a high level. By the time you graduated, you get the Mary Seminac Award, which is given to uh, out each year to the best female athlete on campus. So what was your reaction to receiving that honor? Um, yeah, it definitely was a shock. Uh, freshman Kelsey would have never, never thought that, um, especially because I had never really been a scorer. Um, even in high school, I was never a scorer. It was always defense with maybe a couple points here and there and doing the little things. And those were always my favorite things to do. Um, but to be able to step up my game to a level to where I was recognized as one of the best within um, the Drexel program is one of the highest honors I think I can get as a Dragon. And I, can, I can't say it was just me either. It, I would not have been where I was if it wasn't for my teammates and for the girls who graduated above me who made me a better player, um, whether it was just with encouragement or with uh, understanding how to be a better leader or um, making a shot if I gave them an assist, like something as little as that. But um, it, was, it was such a great honor to, to have um, within the Drexel program. Well, transitioning uh, back to some community stuff, you're, you've been involved with uh, an organization called Friends of the PMBL. So for mm -hmm. people who are unfamiliar with that, could you explain to them what that is, how you got involved and what that program does? Yeah, so that um, PMBL stands for Philadelphia Men's Basketball League. Um, and I actually got involved with this through Sarah Curran, who um, did it uh, the year prior. But every summer, um, we get together as coaches and we raise money to buy um, sneakers and um, jerseys and socks and um, other like bags and stuff like that um, for kids in Jamaica. So every summer we go for about a week and we hold a basketball clinic or camp um, for kids from five, six years old to 19, 20 and even older. Um, and it's, one of the most amazing experiences that I get to do every summer and I live for it when it comes up, but cause these, some of these children out there, they don't have any shoes. Like they're coming to play on basketball barefoot. Um, and if not that, they're just wearing the same shoes that we gave them the following year. So they wear those shoes for the full year. So being able to go out there and one, be able to teach someone else the game that I love, um, two, I get to make relationships um, with other younger kids who are aspiring to grow up and play the sport of basketball and kind of be something. Um, and three, I get to do it with surrounded by people that I love. So it's, it's one of the most probably rewarding um, community service that I do. I honestly, I don't even see it as community service. I just see it as a, a get together and having fun and teaching the game of basketball in um, a place that isn't as high up as it would be in America. Well, the game of basketball, obviously, you know, is a big part of your life and it, and it, it transcends into many levels. And, you know, you took one year away from the program, but it didn't take long because I remember that, that gap year where at every game I'd see you there and you'd be diagramming plays out. Oh, Chris, this is what, the, this is what they should run here against this zone. Or like, look, look, Hannah's going to, Hannah's going to cut right. Yeah. So, Naturally, you go and return as a graduate assistant last year. You're in your second year now. How have things changed? Amy taking over as the coach. How are things looking different this year for the Dragons as you look at and approach 2021? And what should we expect this year from the Drexel squad? Um, I, it, was, it was a pretty uh, easy transition since Amy, again, has been in the program for so many years. So kind of just slide. It was just changing her title. And um, all the girls already have that amazing respect for Amy as a coach um, and now as a head coach. So, um, and we also had Stacy returning as well as myself and Mike. So um, that relationship with the staff didn't really change so much. And then we have the addition of Jillian Dunstan and Laura Kurz, which just puts the program up just a little bit higher. Um, but I expect pretty, pretty great things. Like, just like um, we were talking prior, like they took some time over this COVID um, pandemic to develop their game. And even though it was hard because you have to do it by yourself and you have to do it distance and 
there wasn't any rim, so it's more ball handling. You can do some form shooting in the air, but the girls really dove into taking that opportunity to work on things that they were allowed to work on um, within the pandemic and then bringing that once we were back together um, onto the court. So, I mean, Amy is an amazing head coach and she's an even more amazing person. So I know she's going to do great things and having um, Stacy as the right next to her as her um, associate head coach. Um, we're expecting pretty great things to come from the girls and, and the staff all together. And for you, second year as a, as a graduate assistant, what are, you, what are your personal goals in terms of coaching? Do you have an interest in having a coaching career? Yeah, so um, in between that little gap year, um, that was where I was kind of deciding where, what route I wanted to go. And like you said, I was at every single game. Like, I wasn't going to not be there if I could. And just even sitting in the crowd when I would watch the games, I would kind of call the play in my head. And then at that time when Denise was there and she'd call the same play, and I was like, okay. So, like, and we're kind of thinking the same. I'm kind of seeing what she's seeing. and. Um, with that. And then once I got the position, um, it kind of added on to me realizing like, okay, I think this is, I think this is the path for me to go on, especially since basketball has been almost my entire life. And it's something that I don't want to live without. And knowing that I could get into a career where I get to wake up and do what I love every single day. Um, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do that. Like that, I think that's every person's dream when you get into the career field. So um, being able to learn under Denise and now getting to be able to learn, continue to learn under Amy, um, it's definitely going to help me and push me forward with kind of following that suit. And, and what advice would you give to other student athletes who want to get into coaching? What would you tell uh, another girl who's graduating this year and who needs some advice in terms of how to, how to build that career? What, what, what advice would you offer to her? Um, I think I would say, um, one is use those relationships that you've created while you were in that program to kind of push you and help you get to places where you want to be, whether that was your teammates or, um, whether that's your coaching staff, have conversations with, um, your coaching staff and bring up that saying that I want to get into this role. Like, what do you think about that? How do you think is the best route um, to move forward with this? And there's, especially in the NCAA world, there's so many relationships um, that people know and can help you get to where you want to be. So if you're set on being a coach and that's the path you want to go on, have a conversation with someone who is in that field. And that's where your first step is in moving forward and following that dream that you have. That's good advice. I appreciate you sharing that. One, one final question, because 20 minutes flies by before you know it. I can't believe it. Uh, but I did want to ask you, you put out a video in June this year, uh, obviously with, with the social climate right now, with all that's going on with Black Lives Matter. It was a Juneteenth video. It got some very solid reception. So what was your inspiration for that? What was the reasoning you, you wanted to do that? And then what was the process for getting everybody involved for filming that? Um, yeah, so... Obviously, it's been a hard time um, in America, um, not just with the pandemic, but with the um, racial injustice and racism that we're seeing. Um, and one of my favorite quotes by MLK is the um, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And I just felt like there was just so much hate and worry going around in the world. And we just needed some love like we just need to let love prevail over everything and um, with that that's where the idea kind of came into my head that I want to show that no matter how old you are or what race you are um, love will prevail so I texted my friends and my family and old teammates and um, kind of asked them and it was optional you didn't have to and I was so happy to see that everyone was willing to just take the time to um, make that video for me and let me edit it and put it together and share it with everyone just to show like, again, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you live. Like if we love, love can change the world. So it was just something, just a 
something in my head that I just wanted to share with everybody and would hope that it kind of just give a little bit of just like a sigh of relief and just breathe for a second to know like it's going to be okay. Well, that's, that's powerful stuff, Kelsey. And you, you know, listen, you've done some powerful, powerful stuff in your career, in, in your personal life and how you've affected the community. So I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to come on the podcast and talk a little bit about that, provide some potential inspiration for some other people who are watching this. Uh, thanks again for your time today, Kelsey. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here.